النور ألبسنا حسنا واتجانا والأنس والشحنا نورا واتبيانا بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Brothers and sisters in Islam It's a delight to see you all here mashaAllah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said سيأتي زمان على أمتي There shall come a time upon my ummah upon my nation upon the people who follow me upon the people who believe in me they call themselves Muslims and believers my ummah when their prayers are not prayed correctly and when high buildings spread in every place when people swear in the name of Allah a lot about everything without fulfilling their oath, people curse each other a lot. Bribery and adultery prevails. People neglect the hereafter in order to buy the luxuries of this world in exchange for the hereafter. So people become materialistic. The Prophet sallallahu said, فَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ ذَلِكَ فَالنَّجَاةَ النَّجَاةَ If you see this happening in your time, then seek refuge, seek refuge. Find a solution to get away from all of this. It's not an easy solution. But you need to stay away from all this. In one other hadith, a man said, Ya Rasulullah, what is seeking refuge how do I seek protection what do you mean by that and Rasul Sallallahu gave an expression like this he said by adhering to your house and keeping your mouth shut and hold your tongue and hand from doing unlawful until death comes to you there's gonna come a time even worse than this one brothers and sisters where a person becomes so confused about what is happening in the world so deluded by everything that they see and hear that they're not going to know what to do and where to go and who to stand with except to stay away from things even if they mean sitting at home abstaining from all of this because there's not much they can do anymore they want to do good but where do they go they want to avoid the bad but it's all the way all around I heard a lot of young people say to me now why does Islam say everything is haram 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 this is not true. Islam does not say everything is haram. But when there's so much haram around us and corruption, Islam looks like it's forbidden everything. But because we live in a time where the Prophet ﷺ told us that sins will be taken lightly and that modesty will be very invaluable, which leads us to that human life becomes invaluable. Human life becomes invaluable. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all these hadiths can be found in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, and Tirmidhi, and Abu Dawood. These are called the six books of hadith, Numaja and Nisa'i. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, prayers are not prayed correctly. People pray without really meaning to pray anymore. Their five daily salat are done in a hurry, in a rush, with neglect, uh, no importance is taken to them. If money comes in the way, the prayer is lost. The prayer is delayed. If a boy wants to meet a girl to chat her up and it's time for salat, he'll ignore the salat. If there is something of worldly benefit to them, the salat becomes the last thing on their mind. One brother said to me once, Brother, I don't pray Jumu'ah because I work. He said, have you tried to seek time off? He said, no, because Islam says to me that I have to look after my family. The response to that is obvious. If it wasn't for Allah providing you with this family, you wouldn't have a family aslan in the beginning. When you turn away from Allah and become ungrateful to Him and rely on other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
Allah describes this type of family like the family of the spider in the Quran. The family of the spider is very weak, it falls apart. It's not stable. Then he said, high buildings are spread everywhere. This hadith also comes in a different manner. When Jibreel alayhi salam once entered, he sat as a man. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, we saw this man enter one time. And the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with us in the masjid. And this man who entered, he had a very black beard with very black hair and a very white thobe, clothing. He did not look like he was traveling because you couldn't see any dust on his clothing and none of us knew him. So who was this man? They didn't have airplanes in those days and cars to travel very quickly. And he sat to the Prophet ﷺ very respectfully. He asked him several questions. And the last of the questions he asked him was this. Mata sa'a? When is the last hour? And at every time he would say to him, you are truthful, you are truthful. They thought, how come he's asking him questions and saying that you, he is truthful when he's the questioner? And then he's telling him that you've said the truth. As though he is testing him. In the end he said, when is the last hour going to come? When's the world going to end? And he said, the questioner who is asking me, or the person you are asking, is no more knowledgeable about its hour, about its time than the questioner. Meaning, you and I don't know. I don't know any better than you. So we asked him, what are its signs? Some of its signs, when it comes close. And he mentioned two things, very important. أَن تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا When the mother, the servant of Allah, is one meaning, it's probably the most likely meaning. When the mother gives birth to her daughter or son, and this daughter becomes like a boss, a master over her, as if her mother is her slave. In another hadith, Rasul said, when the son, when the son, the boy, son, he chooses his friend closer and distances his father away. This time wasn't, never existed in their days. Even among the Christians and the Jews, this didn't exist. It was a time that was very unusual to the people. That the mother will give birth to her daughter who when she grows up, she acts like she's the master and boss over her own mother. And their parents, in other words. And you will see the destitute, barefooted Bedouins who follow, who are sheep herders or uh, they are shepherds. They, are, they will be building very high towers in the sky, skyscrapers. Today we see this, many signs of this everywhere. The Bedouins are actually today in the Emirates, places like the Qatar. Now they're actually competing in this. Yatatawaluna fil bunyan means that they will be competing in making high towers. Who will make the higher tower than the other person? So materialism and uh, technology becomes the main motive of people in competing for. And if you look at society today, you will see that when people say we are an advanced society, we don't live in the caves anymore, what they're trying to tell us is that now we are more intelligent. With what? What are we more advanced in? Rasul said, يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ They'll be competing about who can make the highest buildings, high rises. Meaning they'll compete with their technology, with their sophisticated engineering and building. What is so special about an advanced society who knows how to build machines or buildings or send satellites into space or build rockets or build atom bombs? The only thing I can think about is to kill people, to destroy the poor, to show off in worldly possessions for mere greed and power uh, of the way that Iblis used to show to Adam when he said, I am better than him, you created me from fire and you created him from, from soil and I will lead all of them astray and make them go into hellfire with me. Same thing. So we'll be competing with technology. But as for modesty, as for character, as for trust, as for family, as for worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as for uh, justice, as for leadership in justice looking after people, as for you know, the uh, value of human life, of children looking after the orphans, the poor, the needy, the destitute, all of this will be lost. No one will be thinking about it. In fact, let me tell you something. In America, there was a re 
an article which read that in America they make 50 billion dollars on pharmaceutical products, on medicine alone. 50 billion dollars on medicine. What does this mean? What is happening to the world? 50 billion dollars annually of profit on medicine. These are people who are getting ill and sick. Are people getting more sicker and ill? Are there people pumping in these diseases? Are, 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 are people denying medicine to these people? Why are they making the medicine so extremely expensive? We hear about cancer patients. And we hear about all these other types of patients in this severe illness. Leukemia. Juvenile leukemia as well. All these children who are dying of these, these diseases that have just popped up suddenly. And then we find that medicine cannot be afforded. You know, a brother said to me who has cancer, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure him. I'm coming to a point. He said, I went to the St. Vincent's Hospital and over there they gave me this special medicine for my leukemia to treat me, to manage it. He said, this special medicine works in managing and relieves me of pain. But for one week supply it cost $3,500. I had this subsidy, you know, Medicare subsidy, which only required me to pay $35. But then they stopped giving it to me because they said the government cannot afford to pay for the medicine anymore for its people. So they went to a lesser medicine and people are dying. Innocent people are being killed because medicine is too expensive. People are after capitalism just to make money and more money and to climb high and rise high. And I'm not saying this is the Arabs, I'm saying it throughout the world. 70-80% of people are surviving on about 40 cents a day. What is happening to the world we live in? Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, people will compete for worldly possessions, for technology. And they will say, as though he is saying, society will base its advancement on their technology. Whatever happened to the morals, justice, equity, treatment of others, the rights of others, modesty. This is what values a society. Not how nice you can make things and kill people with it. Our Rasul sallallahu said, people will swear oath by Allah on false things. So you come to buy and people will use the religion to convince you to buy their product. By swearing by Allah's name, it only cost them this much for example. By swearing by Allah's name that this is what happened to them. They will try to take money off you and call it in the name of donation and charity and swear by Allah that they are poor. Swear by Allah that there is no, you know, uh, an orphanage they're going to build. Other than brother Abu Umar who is going to call you today honestly to build an orphanage in Syria insha'Allah. Alhamdulillah. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that they will curse a lot. La'an. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said people will curse their own fathers. They said, Ya Rasulullah, who curses his own father? He said, there will come a time where people will curse, you will curse their father and so they will curse your father in return. So what, what is the meaning of this? It means that people no longer value parenthood. People no longer value the relationships of people with others. They'll wipe them off, they'll curse them, they'll have hatred, and people will only think about themselves. Rasul Sallallahu tells us that bribery and adultery will, be, will prevail. Prevail. You know what prevail means? Yafsha. Wa yafsha zina. Wa rasha, awar risha, awar rashwa, which is bribery. Yafsha means, or yafsha means to prevail, meaning it becomes the norm everywhere. And he even said, that there will come a time where a person will be walking down the street and they will see a man and a woman committing acts of adultery and fornication before everyone's eyes, not afraid of the criticism. And they will say, well, at least you could have just moved aside so that we can walk past, you know. Just make some room. It's okay what you're doing. It looks cute, but we just want to walk. That's all, you know. But keep going. Subhanallah. This means that modesty and morality dies out completely throughout the world, whether they are in the Muslim lands or the non-Muslim lands. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to talk too much about what is happening there. But if you do your research, you will find that in both worlds, I don't want to name countries so that I don't find, sound racist, but it is happening double, triple. Tourists go from Western countries to these particular countries in order to have a great time with their lust, temptations, alcohol, and so on and so forth. It's happening. 
adultery becomes so prevailed that husband and wife divide and they divorce and children become, you know, to sort of live on their own and morality is gone because they cannot control their lusts and people will be afraid of getting married because they don't want to commit. They cannot control their desires. The man still wants to sleep around, the woman wants to sleep around. Nowadays, it's very difficult to find someone to identify you as a husband and wife. They say, partner. Is this your partner? People are afraid to say husband and wife. Why? Because hardly anyone wants to get married anymore. So they say, partner. Oh, we respect the fact that you don't want to get married and commit and value that partner. People neglect the hereafter in order to buy commodity from this world. They sell the hereafter for this world. And this is when a person neglects their worship, neglects the hereafter, and they focus on what they can see only in this world. Their clothing becomes extravagant. Their food, they live to eat. Their coffee, they live to drink coffee. They love to display themselves with their ornaments only to show off their beauty to the people whom they're not meant to show it off to. Yani the men and the women, they begin to display themselves in front of the opposite gender and forget about their wives and their husbands whom they should be sharing this beauty with. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw in hellfire. Brothers and sisters, I'm just quoting the facts. I'm not trying to put anything on anyone. Just the facts of what the Prophet ﷺ said. And Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke, he spoke out of sorrow and sadness about the future of what will happen to his ummah. Because when he was in his last breath, Rasul ﷺ said to his ummah, Please, I have left you on the clear white page. Its day, its night is as clear as its day. Do not swerve away from it. Today I have perfected your religion. Today I have, and he recited Allah's verse, Today I have perfected your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and am pleased with Islam submission to God as your religion. And Rasul Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, bear witness I have informed, I have informed. He was sad. What is he saying? I saw in hellfire a group of women, for example, whom I've never seen the likes of before, meaning of the future. They are dressed but undressed. They walk in a seductive manner. Ma'ilatim mumilat. And they do fashions upon their heads in order to, in a type that attracts attention. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, this is something of the future. He's never seen the likes of before, not among the Romans, the Byzantines of his time. He did not see them among the Persians of his time. He did not see them among the Mushrikeen of his time or among the Muslims of his time. This is something which the humans begin to do at large, Muslim, non-Muslim. And he said, among my ummah, from my nation, subhanallah. And how often do we find young people imitating and copying? Who? Celebrities. Where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did tell us that there will come a time when upon my ummah, they will begin to follow them step by step, foot by foot, that if they were to enter the hole of a lizard, they will follow them. حَتَّى وَلَوْ دَخَلُوا جُحْرَ ضَبٍ لَدَخَلْتُمُوهُ قَالُوا they said, O Messenger of Allah, do you mean that we will be following step by step the customs and traditions and morals of the Christians and Jews of that time? He said, Yes. Who else? The Romans will be the largest in number and power and influence. This is a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. You find it in Sahih Muslim. That the Romans, the Romans in those days used to call them Ar-Rum. Ar-Rum you know, means today something like the Europe basically the Europeans of today. That we, they will be the larger amount, they will have the most influence on people, such as Hollywood, such as you know, uh, Britain and France and all those other places. They will have influence on people, on my ummah, he said. And you will follow them step by step. Not, not, any, some things are good, but majority is bad. Their customs and morals. What do we see in our young people? Whether they are in the Arab countries or outside, in the Muslim countries or outside, in the Western countries or beyond it, the Muslim youth, look at them. What kind of things do you like to dress in? What kind of people do you imitate? Who do you really want to be like? Really. And don't fool yourself. Who do you really want to be like? And then some of them feel guilty today to the point where they try to justify things like uh, that the Prophet ﷺ has forbidden and turn it into a religious thing, such as tattooing. 
I've seen young people tattooing now on themselves ayat of the Quran, the name of Allah. And they say, you know, I've tattooed it because I want my Lord to know this is who I am, this is my identity. But they don't pray. They're drinking. They're out neglecting themselves, staying up all night, neglecting their salat, neglecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They probably even break their fast in Ramadan. What is this? Copying and imitating the wrong people. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, he said, إِنَّ بَيْنَ يَدَيِ السَّاعَةِ كَقِطَعٍ مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ الْمُظْلِمِ Before the end of time, you will see this prevailing sign. What is it? There will be afflictions, 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 trials, tests of hardship. Afflictions that are like smoke filling the air, darkness with dark clouds above you. And it will weaken the heart of a person just like his body weakens. In the morning he is a believer and by the evening he becomes a disbeliever. And in the evening he is a believer and by the morning he is a disbeliever. So much fitan, confusion, deception, lies. A person in the evening is a believer. By the morning they went on the internet and it confused everything about their religion to the point where they become atheists. They become something other than their own religion. We live in this time today. How many times I get this question now from young people? I never used to get them, you know, a few years back. How do I know if my religion is the correct one? You know, I've been debating with this atheist and wallah, I don't know what to answer. I'm thinking of becoming an atheist myself. Yes. Have you heard about the Muslim Gay Society? There's one in Sydney, there's one in America, and there's one in London. The one in America is very old, the oldest one. The one in London is second oldest. There is a lesbian mosque and a male gay mosque. Now, our Rasul Sallallahu told us, you will have uh, before the end of time, a immatum mudillun. You will have leaders who will lead you astray. In America, there is a masjid. Its imam is a woman who gives the khutbah and she leads the men and women in salat. Even a woman makes the adhan. And the men say takbir when they hear her khutbah. Takbir about what, I wonder? Because this is an abomination of what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. There is equality between man and women. And Rasul Sallallahu the Quran already made it. Allahu Akbar. But in an appropriate manner. A way that, there is, that shows you self-respect, teaches you self-respect. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us these people who wake up in the morning believers and by the end of the night they are disbelievers. He said, يَبِعُونَ دِينَهُمْ وَأَخْلَاقَهُمْ بِعَرَضٍ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا The reason is that they sell their character, their morals and their religion because of a gain of this world. Lust, desire, money, a car, fame, fortune, whatever, you name it. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A time shall come when a person is given insight in the daytime. So he's very aware. He can tell you so many things about everything of the world. But in the evening he commits every sin under the sun, takes bribes, become dishonest, etc, etc, etc. People are very good in front of people. But when you are alone in secret, they break every sin under the sun, as though Allah is not watching them. This is hypocrisy. And we live in a world of hypocrisy. Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Think about this. If you take the whole world, it is made up of people. Take away the disbelievers if you don't want them there. And count the Muslims alone, for example. Then the Muslims are made up of nations. These nations are made up of states. These states are made up of communities. The communities are made up of families and the families are made up of units of families. Each unit of family is made up of members. Unit members, one, a son, a daughter, sons, daughters, father, mother. When this individual and the next individual, and the third individual, and all these one individuals become hypocrites and corrupt their state, what happens? The whole community is automatically corrupt. 
The whole state is already automatically corrupt. Then the nation and then the world. More than one point something billion Muslims in the world. And look at our state. Look at our state. What were the images we saw? What Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells detrimental hadith wallahi. He said, لا خير فيكم إذا فسد أهل الشام. There is no good in you, O Muslims, when the day comes that the people of Sham are corrupt. Their state is corrupt. They're neglected. Their state is destruction. There is no good in you. As though saying, Sham is the heart of you. And if its people are not looked after anymore, what is wrong with the Ummah of the Muslims of the world? Something is terribly, terribly wrong. We can blame the leaders. And Rasul Sallallahu did say, that there will come a time when you will have leaders who are form of, in the form of dictatorship and they are unjust and they will lead you in tyranny. And he also said, when the time comes, when the amana, the trust is given to the person who cannot hold it and the person who is a liar is believed and the, believing, and the person who is trustworthy is said to be a liar. Yes, it's going to come. But what about you and me who are not leaders? We have a responsibility first for, my, for yourself. Are you fulfilling that responsibility by being a person obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A person fulfilling your character? A person fulfilling your deen in the proper manner? Or are you a hypocrite in the day good, in the night sinful? In, your, in a person's face, mashaAllah, behind his back, depending on who's around me. Listen to this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu He said, <clears throat> The last hour will not come until you find yourself that if you were among 20 young men, more or less, and you check their faces, you look at them all, and you are a believer, you're a good believer, and you looked at you know, a number of 20 or more or less, and found out that none of them fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is time for the hour. What is he saying? He's saying when you see young men, there are many of them, and they're in large numbers together, hanging out in certain places or going together, and you cannot see any signs of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their faces as a whole, then wait for the last hour to come. We're talking about from the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. What does this mean? In the nightclubs, they go in groups. In mixed weddings, singing and dancing, they're in groups. Going out to meet two or three girls, they're in groups. A concert happens where a singer comes along or a dancer or whatever, and they go in groups. Not one or two, in groups. They go to commit fahisha. They go to, you know, have argila all night until fajr time. Neglecting the maghrib prayer, neglecting the isha prayer, neglecting the fajr prayer. Because as soon as they get home, they're too tired. They've got to give their body rights. So these young people full of energy and muscles and brains and, and strength, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you as the leaders of this ummah. You are the responsible people. Wasting their time, wasting their bodies, wasting their energy, wasting their youth, wasting their health. On what? on just fulfilling the desires of this body and smoking things that kill you, burning their money on things that kill them. Everywhere in the world they exist, brothers and sisters. Ar Rasul Sallallahu said, when you see this, then await for the last hour to come. And he said, when there will be more evil people, pe persons than the good ones, to the point when, listen to this, when the believers will hide themselves. يَسْتَخْفِي مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنْ كَمَا يَسْتَخْفِي الْمُنَافِقُ فِينَ الْيَوْمِ The believers will hide themselves, too ashamed or too embarrassed or too scared to show themselves that they are believers, just like the way, Rasul Sallallahu said, just like the way hypocrites today hide themselves. Hypocrites. In Medina there were 17 hypocrites who used to look like Muslims on the outside, but they were actually spies there to plan and plot for the destruction of the Muslims. So they used to act like Muslims that they were actually disbelievers on the inside. There were 17 of them. No one knew about them except the Rasul Sallallahu and Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. Even Umar anhu asked, who are they? And he wouldn't tell him. They were like that. And he said, it will come a time where the believers will hide themselves from the, because of the amount of any corruption that's out there. Wallahi, as a teacher, I see this among the students all the time, among the youth. At home, they're one thing. In the masjid, Allahu Akbar. But at school, with their friends, when they're out, totally different people, totally different. See sisters, 
depends on who they're sitting with. Subhanallah, suddenly the language changes from Subhanallah to talking about other people, to bagging other people, to cursing other people. What is this? For Rasul said, the believers begin to feel shy to show that they're believers. They're too afraid. They don't want to get up and feel proud of it. Abadan. Because they're afraid that they'll be blamed by their friends and told, look at you, you're uh, acting like a Muslim now. And subhanallah, I, what, one of the worst things we hear now is this trend where young people call each other this three letters um, uh, uh, um, acronym, FRG they call them, fake religious uh, guy or girl. I need to deter people away from trying to be religious. You find them, mashaAllah, they come from home, beautiful, modesty, character. And then they meet these other people and they uh, get overwhelmed by the bullying, you know, mental bullying. And so they become corrupt themselves. The shame goes away from them as if they weren't Muslims at all. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now said, Al-Mahdi, the awaited Mahdi who will lead the Ummah of Islam. You all know who I'm talking about. There is a man called Al- who is anointed Al-Mahdi. His name is Muhammad, son of Abdullah, will come out and he will lead the Muslim Ummah of the world into justice. And he will fight the army of who the Prophet ﷺ called the army of someone called the Dajjal, the deceiver, the liar. And he will fill the Arab world in other words, the Muslim world, because in those days of Rasul Sallallahu when he was telling this hadith, the majority of Islam was still in the Arab Peninsula before it actually spread out. So he's telling the Arabs, says in the Arab world, he will fill it with justice just as it was filled with oppression. Some scholars say it actually literally means the Arab countries, because the majority of injustice will be in the Arab countries, namely Asham. He said when the Mahdi comes out, this Arab world will be fooled with injustice. And you know what Ar Rasul Sallallahu tells us? He tells us in this hadith, this Ummah will always be under the protection of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and within and under His, under his protection, under His care, so long as its scholars and its reciters of the Qur'an do not become hypocrites only to please its leaders. And so long as the righteous people do not give fame to those who are criminals. And so long as the good of them, the good people, do not submit to the bad of its people. For when they do this, Allah will lift His care from them. And He will allow for the oppressors to be upon them. And they will oppress them in such a hardship, they will afflict upon them torture. And then poverty, poverty will afflict them as a nation. Is this not the case now in the Arab world? Yes it is. Although there are people, mashaAllah, still standing with angels above them in a sham and the places like that, I know. There did come a time, and I have to say the truth, and I lived there for four years and saw and heard. There did come a time where people did leave their deen. Where people began to resort to corruption. Trust became like a prophet. People swore oaths on lying in order to make wealth and money. People began to follow the West. Poor people, they go and borrow to buy a very expensive watch or a very expensive pe- uh, suit only to look like they are important even though their mothers and fathers are starving. I saw this. And it was there when I saw people swearing at Allah and the religion. I never witnessed this here in a Western country from the Muslims. They were on drugs here. They might not pray. They might be the worst of the worst in relation to morals. But I've never heard a Muslim swear at the religion of Allah. We saw this. And since the sham are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this great value upon them, 
it is only a responsibility that people, us, we should adhere to the correct principles of our deen to become, because we are the role models. You know the prophets of Allah, when they made a small mistake, a human mistake, what happened? The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yani, for example, Yunus alayhi salam, when he made a small mistake by leaving his people without permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah punished him so severely. Because the prophets, they know the reality, they're supposed to be role models, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them, punishes them double, triple of us. And when they do good, Allah rewards them double, triple of us. So when you are a role model, then expect the affliction and the consequence to be more. Yes, I know there are children. I know that there are innocent people. Zainab radiallahu anha, the daughter of the, or the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because he had also had a wife named Zainab. He once woke up from his bed with his face pale and he said, Wailun lil Arab min sharrin qad iqtarab. Woe to the Arabs, the Arabs specifically, from a terrible a badness, a terrible evil that has come very near to them. This is 1,400 years ago. And he made this with his finger. He did a little ring and he said, the radam, the seal that has been placed around Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, this much has been opened from it. Allahu A'lam, what this means for us. But what it does, what, it, what is important is that Zainab radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulallah, anuhlaku wa fina salihun, will we be destroyed or will we suffer like this? And while there are among us those who are righteous and innocent, Rasul Sallallahu said, Yes, إِذَا كَثُرَ الْخَبَثِ if immorality, immodesty, badness, evil, it expands and spreads and becomes the prevailing thing. So what will happen to these innocent, righteous people? Rasul Sallallahu said, يُبْعَثُ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ They'll be gathered on a day of judgment on what they died upon, on their good intentions. We're all going to die, the young and the old, whether you are in war or not in war, whether you are afflicted, by catastrophes or not, whether you are in the perfect health or not, richest or poor, we have to meet death. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a soul away and we look at it and think, why is Allah doing this? Be careful. Allah is wiser than you. Allah has a bigger plan than you know. You will have to know everything about everything. Allah has placed a plan that is light years ahead of what we can see right now. And when these youngsters go, maybe, maybe, I'll give you an example, maybe Allah is taking these young ones because He doesn't want them to live more in this atrocity. Because maybe ahead of them is something greater. And these young people, Allah wants to reward them for their affliction to put them in Jannah straight away. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken these believers to give them the reward of shahada, of martyrdom, which is the greatest reward anyone can have. Dying under zulm, under oppression, to place them in the highest reward. Maybe Allah, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them so much that He will, cannot bear to let them even live another day. He wants them to Him straight away. When a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was dying, he put his arms up to Allah and Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I understood from him that he was saying, I was given the option of staying in this world or going to my Lord. And I said, Rabbi, he said, Rabbi, uridu Rabbi, my Lord, I want my Lord. I miss him. I miss him. Death is not a reward or a punishment for anybody. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows why this happens. And these people that we see, the sorrow is not upon them, wallahi al-azim. I know it looks terrible. The sorrow or the thought and the reflection is upon us. You know, inside of our own homes, with our family, do you, a hus are you a husband who afflicts and oppresses your wife? Is the wife one who afflicts and oppresses her husband or your children? Do you waste food? Do you waste clothing? Do you waste money? I mean, the other day, a young child, he was eating a banana, and a little bit of it was left. He said, I don't eat the last bit. I said to them, if I brought you a child from Syria right now, and I showed you that this child hasn't eaten for a week, and they've got one more day to live, and that this little bit of banana could make them survive one more day, would you give it to them? They said, of course. I said, then why are you throwing it in the rubbish bin? We've, we, we make our plates of food so big, as though we live to eat and we're going to die if we don't eat to the, to the brink of our stomachs. And then if the food is not that good, we complain and complain and complain. If the coffee is really a little bit out, we complain and complain. If we don't have our dose for the morning, we say, Oh man, I haven't had my coffee. Sorry I've been angry. Sorry I've been swearing. Sorry I'm bad to your husband, wife, children, because I haven't had my coffee this morning. They're called first world problems. 
First of all, maybe inshallah will give a little lesson about first world problems and compare it to third world problems. Sist brothers and sisters in Islam, I won't take too much of your time. In my long conclusion is this. We live therefore in a time that is paving the way for the coming of this person called a dajjal a dajjal literally means the liar, the deceiver. And this deceiver cannot deceive people so perfectly until a road or an environment has been prepared for his coming. He can't just go in like that. It has to be prepared. Just like the road for atheism was prepared in the 17th century when the Church of Christ fell. People didn't you know, trust the church anymore. So people like Darwin, Charles Darwin and other phys um, uh, um, uh, physicians and theorists, they came up to say there's no God. And suddenly now it's atheism. Just like they paved the way for homosexuality to be accepted. When you don't believe in God, you don't believe in a soul, you're just like an animal. So they said, well, you know, animals are gay as well. We've seen monkeys do it like that. So why don't we just be like them? They paved the way. They set the pace. And then all these other catastrophes come along. A Dajjal requires that the environment has to be set up for him. And with all this Dajjal, this era of deception we live in today, you look at the media and you don't know what to believe anymore. You trust Al Jazeera, then the next day you see something, you think, oh my God, but can I really trust them? You trust another uh, media site, and then the next day something kills you. And where do you go? Media is the most powerful tool today that has ever existed. The most powerful. And we do not live in a world of wars with, with weapons anymore. It is a war of ideology and media. Media. Deception upon deception upon deception. For Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, I want you to listen to this beautiful hadith, <coughs> which is in Bukhari and Muslim. He said, what will you do when? What will you do when? Iraq. Iraq. Muni'at al Iraq qafizaha wa dinaraha. When Iraq is denied its currency, the qafizaha is the old currency of Iraq. What will be your state and what will you do when a sham, when its currency is denied? And what will you do when Egypt, its currency will be denied? And you return to where you began in the first place. What does this mean? When Iraq is denied its currency, when a country falls, its currency falls as well, doesn't it? And you no longer deal with its currency another currency replaces it. Rasul Sallallahu or the narrator of this hadith, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi was asked, how will it fall? And he said, by foreign intervention. Foreign intervention. Al-Ajam. So Iraq's currency will fall by the invasion and another currency will replace it. Then, after that, he placed it in sequence. A Sham's currency will be denied. So a sham as a nation will fall. Again, another currency will replace soon and it has to be by a foreign intervention. Currently, we see only one part of it inside. It's a bigger picture than what you think. Yes, this is one part of it. Yes, there are oppressors. There is an oppressor in there. Yes, there are oppressors. Yes, it is there. However, it is all a, it is one of the rocks, one of the plots within the bigger plan. Then Rasul Sallallahu said, after Asham, he mentioned Misr, Egypt. You think it's over for Egypt right now? According to this hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, something else is coming up. When the currency of a nation falls, it means that the country itself falls and there is an invasion. As Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned over here. It's not happened to Egypt yet, but this is, seems like the sequence that Rasul Sallallahu is informing us about it. He also said another narration, this hadith by Abu Huraira, 
ذمة الله وذمة رسوله. What does this mean? ذمة الله meaning the Romans or the non-Muslims who used to exist at the time of Islam, when Islam ruled for more than a thousand years. They were non-Muslims who lived in, in the lands of Islam and they were called Dhummis. Meaning the ones who are entrusted to us. They lived in our lands and we gave them the right to live in peace and they had to pay something in return for our protection of them. But not the Muslims. Muslims pay zakat. They had to pay this thing called jizya, which means that we'll protect you, provide you. Today they say tax. We call it jizya for the non-Muslims who live among us. Only this is a type of agreement. When this, he said, the people who used to do this before, they will no longer do it anymore, meaning they will be overpowering you. And these are the types of people who will invade you. Now this is, these are the facts and we see it today. What has happened to Iraq is not something that anyone can deny. And what is now happening in Asham is both, both intervention within and outside. And it is yet to come. Asham, however, is totally different to the rest of the world. It is different to Iraq. It is different to Egypt. It is different to everything. Asham means Lebanon, Syria, parts of Jordan, Palestine. They call it today Israel. I'll call it Israeli territories are in there. Palestine and parts of Turkey. This was Asham. And you know when after World War I what happened? They divided Asham. They concentrated on Asham to divide it into different states. Each one with a flag. And they turned the Arabs and Turks against each other because we were once one nation. It was called the last Khilafah al uthmaniyya Because we became materialistic and our pride of lineage and our pride of nationalism and our pride of racism crept into us. This was the best way to plot and plan to break us apart. Until today, look at us in misery. For Rasul Sallallahu said, "Trukuha fa innaha muntina." Leave it alone, for it is a stinking carcass. It cannot bring anything, anything but misery, unhappiness, and stench. This is what's happening to us today. Our Rasul Sallallahu said, "Our Rasul Sallallahu said, you will also get into a war with the Jews." This type of war that we are in is not like any war you've ever seen before. We are now currently in there. Who are we? Meaning mostly the Arab lands. For Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in Musnad Ahmad, he said, you will fight the Jews, meaning the Zionists who are occupying Israel now, uh, Palestine is Israel. عَلَىٰ نَهْرٍ فِي الْأُرْدُنْ أَنْتُمْ وَهُمْ غَرْبِيُّهُ At the cross or the section of a river, that is in Jordan, you will be on its east and they will be on its west bank. That is today. The narrator of this hadith says, Wallahi, I did not know where Jordan is. In those days, there's no such thing as Jordan. No one knew Jordan. It was always called Sham. Remember? After World War I, it became, or just before that, it became Jordan. The name came out later. Later, later. Hundreds of years after the Prophet ﷺ. How did the Prophet ﷺ know this? Because he's a messenger of Allah. He doesn't speak out of his own desires, except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, you will fight them, be in battle with them at that river that is in Jordan, which divides you from the west. They'll be on the west, you'll be on the east. And there is a river there that has dried out a few years ago. Subhanallah. So the Arabs are on one side and the Jews are on the other, occupying Palestinian land. In fact, the Jews believe that there will be Jesus Christ who will come out very soon. And the Christians believe that Jesus Christ will come again. But the Christians also believe in an Antichrist. We believe in the Dajjal. We don't call him Antichrist. Yes, he will be against Christ or Christ will be against him alayhi salam. But a Dajjal literally means the one-eyed, the liar, the deceiver. Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And Rasul Sallallahu gave us descriptions about him. He is a person. He is a person. But as I said, the things that are happening now is a welcoming to, for his coming. And when he comes out, the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come. They believe the ancient Jesus, the real Jesus, he was an imposter, he was a false Messiah. This is in their Torah now, now, which they have played around with. So they're still waiting for the Messiah. But they say the Messiah will not come out until the Temple of Solomon is rebuilt. They have to rebuild it. And the state of Israel becomes established 
And the word of God, meaning the religion of the Israelites, of the Torah, is practiced throughout the world. That's what they said in the Torah. Then the Messiah will come out. That's when the Messiah will come out. The Christians, they say, there will be an Antichrist, who is the Dajjal, and then Christ will come out against him. So they're very close to the Muslims. But Rasul Sallallahu stood up and he said, I will tell you, every prophet that came to his people who told him something about the Dajjal, but I will tell you something about him that no other prophet has ever told his people. And he began to describe so much about his features, you can read about it in Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari. There's so much description about him for the lack of time now. But this is what he said. He said, there hasn't come an affliction, a trial, greater from the time of Adam, this hadith in Sahih Muslim, from the time of Adam until the end of time, a trial more vicious, more harsha, more deceiving, more upon you than the fitna of Dajjal. If he comes out at a time when I am with you, he is released when I am with you, then I will be the guardian to protect you from it. I take it upon me. Allahu Akbar. This is from his mercy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his care for his ummah. He said, Ana kafifu. I will take him on other than you. Even the Rasul sallallahu cannot kill him. Only Jesus alayhi wa can kill him. He said, but if he comes out after my time, then every person is responsible for themselves. And he said, be careful, for he will deceive you. When he comes out, it will be very difficult to stand your ground. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us, the believers will unknow him from three letters on his forehead, kafir or kufr. And the rest of the world will follow him. The weak believers will follow him. And he will not be able to enter Mecca or Medina. And then Isa alayhi salam will destroy him. This will happen in Palestine. And the Mahdi will rise in Asham, in Syria, in Damascus. And there will be a great war between the Romans, the Europeans of today, 80 flags against the Muslim nation by itself in Asham. It is going to happen soon. After Egypt loses its currency, Al Mahdi will come out. So these are only the beginning of the beginning of what is yet to come brothers and sisters the result of it well over time the Muslims left the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and became materialistic it's as simple as that materialistic competing with materialism and selfless selfishness thinking about ourselves and putting our deen in our hands and our world on our heads so that if the hat on our heads gets out of place, which is our dunya, we put what is in our hands on the floor, which is our deen, in order to fix our dunya. If the dunya is fixed, I'll grab the deen. If the dunya is wrecked, I'll wait. I don't have to practice the deen right now. This is the metaphor I give you. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to release us from the misery that we are in now. I'm talking about the misery of our hearts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the martyrs, those who have died under oppression. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our brothers and sisters in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya, in Chechnya, in uh, Burma, in, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, subhanAllah, in, you tell me brother, in Bali, Ma Mali, sorry brother, subhanAllah, I said Burma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. In Mali, everywhere in the world, wherever they are oppressed, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and accept our dua. Brothers and sisters in Islam, this is what I have for you today. It is only the surface of what the uh, Prophet told us about the coming of the last hour. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people of the righteous and to make us see truthfulness from falsehood. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله. النور ألبسنا حسنا واتجانا والأنس والشحنا نورا واتبيانا.
Mm-hmm.